someone else's kid throws up at a party and you keep eating. <laughs> you consider finger paint to be a controlled substance. You master the art of placing food on a plate without anything touching. Your child insists that you read once upon a potty out loud in the lobby of the doctor's office and you do it. You hire a babysitter because you haven't been out with your husband in ages and then you spend half the night talking about and checking on the kids. You hope ketchup is a vegetable because it's the only one your child eats. You find yourself cutting your husband's sandwiches into unusual shapes. You fast forward through the scene when the hunter shoots Bambi's mother. You obsess when your child clings to you upon parting during his first month at school and then you obsess when he skips in without looking back. You can't bear to give away baby's clothes, it's so final. You know your mother when you hear your mother's voice coming out of your mouth when you say not in your good clothes. You know your mother when you stop criticizing the way your mother raised you. You know your mother when you read that the average five-year-old asks 437 questions a day and you feel proud that your child is above average. <laughs> you know you're a mother when you say at least once a day, I'm not cut out for this job, but you know you wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Here's things that my mother taught me. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. If you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me about religion. You better pray that that, that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straight up, straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> My mother taught me logic because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me more logic. If you fall down out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to the store with me. <laughs> My mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. <laughs> My mother taught me irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. <laughs> My mother taught me about contortionism. Will you look at that dirt on the back of your neck? My mother taught me about stamina. You'll sit there until all that spinach is gone. <laughs> My mother taught me about weather. This room of yours looks like a tornado went through it. My mother taught me about hypocrisy. If I told you once, I've told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> My mother taught me about envy. There are millions of less fortunate children in this world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until we get home. My mother taught me about receiving. You're gonna get it when we get home. My mother taught me medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're gonna freeze that way. <laughs> My mother taught me ESP. Put your sweater on. Don't you think I know when you are cold? My mother taught me humor. When the lawnmower cuts off your toes, don't come running to me. My mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. My mother taught me genetics. You're just like your father. My mother taught me about roots. Shut the door behind you. Do you think we were born in a barn? And my mother taught me wisdom. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. And my favorite, my mother taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just like you. <laughs> Here's why God made mothers. These are answers that came from school-aged children, so keep that in mind. Why did God make mothers? She's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. Think about it, it was the best way to get more people. Um, mostly to clean the house, to help us out there when we are getting born, to help us get out of there when we were getting born. How did God make mothers? He used dirt, just like the rest of us. Magic plus superpowers and a lot of stirring. He made my mom just the same like he made me. He just used bigger parts. <laughs> Why did God give your mother and not some other mom? We're related. God knew she likes me a lot more than the other people's moms like me. <laughs> what ingredients are mothers made of? God makes mothers out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of mean. They had to get their start from men's bones. Then they mostly used string, I think. 
What kind of little girl was your mom? My mom has always been my mom and none of that other stuff. Um, I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be she was pretty bossy. <laughs> they say she used to be nice. How did your mom meet your dad? Mom was working in a store and dad was shoplifting. <laughs> what did mom need to know about dad before she married him? His last name. She had to know his background, like is he a crook? Uh, does he make at least $800 a year? Did he say no to drugs and yes to chores? <laughs> Why did, your, why did your mom marry your dad? My dad makes the best spaghetti in the world, and my mom eats a lot. <laughs> she got too old to do anything else with him. My grandma says that mom didn't have her thinking cap on. <laughs> what makes a real woman? It means you have to be really bossy without looking bossy. Who's the boss at your house? Mom doesn't want to be boss, but she has to be because dad's such a goofball. Mom, you can tell by room inspection, she sees stuff under the bed. I guess mom is, but only because she's a lot more, only because she has a lot more to do than dad. What's the difference between moms and dads? Moms work at work and work at home, and dads just got to work at home, or dads just got to work at work. Moms know how to talk to teachers without scaring them. Dads are taller and stronger, but moms have all the real power, because that's who you gotta ask if you want to sleep over at your friend's house. What does your mother do in her spare time? Mothers don't have spare time. To hear her tell it, she pays bills all day long. What's the difference between moms and grandmas? About 30 years. You can always count on grandmothers for candy. Sometimes mom don't even have bread on them. <laughs> Describe the world's greatest mom. She would make broccoli taste like ice cream. The greatest mom in the world wouldn't make me kiss my fat aunts. She'd always, be, she'd always be smiling and keeping her opinions to herself. Is there anything about your mom that's perfect? Her teeth are perfect, but she bought them from the dentist. Her casseroles, her casserole recipes, but we hate them. Just her children. What would it take to make your mom perfect? On the inside, she's already perfect. Outside, I'm thinking some kind of plastic surgery. A diet, you know, hair dye. I'd dye it, maybe blue. If you could change one thing about your mom, what would it be? She has this weird thing about me keeping my room clean. I'd get rid of that. I'd make my mom smarter, then she would know it was my sister who did it and not me. <laughs> Amen. In Proverbs, the 31st chapter, it says, Who can find a virtuous and a, ca a capable wife? She's more precious than rubles. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spends it. She is like a merchant ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it with her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong and a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches over thing in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her, and her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Amen. So I want every mother in here just to stand to your feet for a moment. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Father, we just bless them right now in the name of Jesus. I lift up every mom that is in this place. Father, I thank you that you are the God of all wisdom.
And Father, whether their children are grown or they still have kids in the house, Lord, that you will lead and guide and direct their footsteps, that you will give them wisdom, Father God, concerning every relationship with every child. Father, I pray for those that maybe their, maybe their children are far off or they might not even have a relationship with them. But God, you are a restorer. And I'm asking you to restore those things, Father God. You can do it no matter what the past is. You're a restorer, Father God. I ask for restoration in those relationships. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And now we just bless them, Father God. I just bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Schaefer's going to come up. We got some wonderful giveaways. Did everybody get a ticket? Every mother? I guess nobody got a ticket. I didn't see one hand go up. So. Is there anybody that didn't get one? You didn't get? You did not? Okay, you have one. All right. Well, if everybody has one, i tell you one thing. As a father, I know I can't compete with my wife as a mother. My kids let me know that all the time, who's the special one in our family. So we got a couple giveaways here. There's a, a planner, an outdoor planner, and a watering can, and then we have a couple gift cards. So I think we're going to start with uh, the watering can. How about that? Let's give away the watering can. I mean, that could make a flower pot within itself, but, you know, put a little dirt in there. I could see Kimmy doing that. <laughs> All right, the first and the winner of the watering can. The last three digits is 872. Right there, there you go. Oh. <laughs> Jackie, come on down. And if you don't have a place to use this, I got about a thousand plants you can water at any time. Just come on over. All right, well, let's give away uh, the Target gift card for $25 to Target. Anybody want to go to Target on the way home? <laughs> let's make sure they're all in, in there. And here we go. The number is 860. 860. There you go. There you go, congratulations. Now we're gonna give away the planner. Somebody said, well, I need the watering can. To, well, just use your water hose. A planner that small, just get a glass of water out the sink, you'll be fine. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know where it comes from either, Ben. 876, 876, who got the planner? All right, there we go. We expect to see beautiful flowers in here. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and lastly, I have a gift card. And those who've already used their ticket are gonna be like, this is what I wanted, to LA Nails. What do they do there with they, That's you? You wanna get your nails done? Maybe I'll get my nails done too, I don't know. They're just always dirty when I come home. My wife bought me a little brush to clean my nails. She's like, your hands are so dirty. I'm like, honey, it shows that I'm a hardworking man. Just a hardworking man is not touching me. No. <laughs> clean your fingers. All right. Oh, that was too much? Oh, okay, sorry. I just saw the look on Morgan's face that said that was too much. I mean, I, I could have just been shaking her hand, Morgan. I mean, come on. 871, $75 to LA Nails. There we go, Cindy. There you go, and happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. Well, thank you, Lord. Let's stand to our feet, pray, and then we're gonna spend some time in the Word once again today. 
Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for your holy written word. Father, I ask that you just give me your ability once again to boldly declare and explain and bring forth your word. I ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Father, I just boldly say that we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. And Father God, may we grab a hold of this. May it cause faith to rise in our heart. And may we operate more accurately in this area that we're talking about today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Last week we began talking about being led by the Spirit of God. And I love it when the Lord leads me to minister on this topic. It's one of my favorite topics. And um, I think it's so needful in the days. It's always been needful. But I think it is so needful in the days in which we live. Because it's crazy times out there. Amen. Amen. And I got good news. You don't have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. You can always be at the right place at the right time. You don't have to make stupid decisions that you regret doing. Anybody ever made a decision and then regret that you did it? Anybody ever bought anything and then wish you didn't buy it? I mean, I think all of us can, all of us can attest to that, that, that we've done some crazy things, and if we would have waited on the Lord, He would have helped us. Well, do you think God is really interested in that? Oh, yeah. He really is. God cares everything about you. He doesn't want you to buy some piece of junk that you, that you have to, it's a money pit, you know what I mean? And it's nickel and diamond you to death and it's a lemon. He knows what's a lemon and what isn't. Amen. So, I mean, he, he cares about every little thing. And I think that sometimes uh, maybe that's where we miss it is we just want him involved in what I call the big things in life. You know, the big decisions that we have to make. He wants to be involved in every decision. Amen. He will, he will, he will even reroute you. He will even reschedule you your day so that you end up where he wants you to be. I mean, only God can take somebody from here and somebody from another state, and his plan all the time was for them to connect, but only God can do something like that. And he does things like that. I'll probably share some examples of, of just how the Lord has, has led me in my life and, and Mary's life. And, and uh, only, God, only God can do these things. And so we need to understand we have to be attentive, if you would, or sensitive to the leadings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit so that we're led by the Spirit of God. In Psalms 23, 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me. Say, He leads me. To lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. I like that. First of all, it's talking about He leads us. It's talking about restoring our soul. And then when He's leading you, even though you have enemies all around, there's still a table that you can be seated at because He's led you to that table. And it doesn't matter what your enemies are doing or what they're saying because He led you to that place at that table. And I can only imagine the goodness that is on that table. And then we talked about how John, how, how Jesus said, The sheep know my voice, and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Now, I like to say this, don't ever say, don't you ever find yourself saying that I cannot hear from God. Because Jesus said, you know the shepherd, and you know his voice, and you don't have to follow the voice of a stranger. Every time you open up the word of God, God is speaking to you. God is talking to you. And so you don't, you don't want to go down that, that, round, that route and say, I don't, I don't hear from God. I have found out lots of times you are hearing from God. Lots of times he's giving you cues, and it's easy to miss those cues. You know what I mean by a cue? It's like you just know something, something isn't right. Something isn't right about the situation, or, or don't go there, or don't go that way. I've had them do that when I've been driving down the road. Don't go that route. Take a different way. And I, I've had examples where he spared, he spared me being injured in car accidents because I listened to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. He's a good God. I said, he's a good God. There's people, there's people who were supposed to get on airplanes on, when 9-11 happened, and something in their spirit told them not to get on the plane. Yeah. Uh, years ago, Jesse, Jesse Duplantis was talking about how he was at this airport, and, um, and, and the Lord started talking to him and saying, don't get on that plane, don't get on that plane. And he's like, he, he went up to the, to the ticket counter and, and, and said, don't let anybody on this plane. You know, that's, that's when you know you heard from God. And of course, they're thinking like, you're crazy. We're not going to, we're, we're letting people on this plane. 
And so uh, he's, he, he's up there trying to find a different flight, you know, make different arrangements. He's not getting on that plane. He said when he said that, there was this businessman up there, and he just kind of like, Phew. who is this guy? You know, when God leads you, people will think you're crazy. People, when, when you talk about being led by the Spirit of God, people think that you're nuts. I'm serious. The, 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 the world thinks this is crazy. You hear from God. Who do you think you are? I think I'm a born-again child of God, and I am in Christ Jesus, and I know the shepherd and the voice of a stranger I will not follow, and as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God, and I'm a son of God. Glory to God. Amen. So, so anyway, the, the plane, everybody gets boarded, and the plane goes down the runway, taxis down, and comes back up to the gate and lets everybody off. And, of course, the businessman said, is this, is this next flight, is that safe to get on? <laughs> He heard from God. Hey, when, when I fly, I love to fly, but I'm, I'm always checking my spirit. Just saying. Just saying. So, Job 32, 8 says this, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. The NLT says it this way, But there is a spirit within people, the breath of the Almighty within them, that makes them intelligent. The message says it this way, but I see I was wrong. It's God's Spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty One, that makes wise human insight possible. The experts have no corner on wisdom. Getting old doesn't guarantee good sense. And then, of course, Proverbs 20, 27, The Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The, the NLT says that the Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing every hidden motives. So then we began to talk about, in 1 Thessalonians, we talk about how the, the, the Scripture says, "...and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly." W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray the God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. And so I, I, I say it this way, it's like the church has put so much emphasis, and, and a lot of it's just religion, so much emphasis on the flesh. And they don't talk about the spirit. You see, you have to do something with the flesh. That's why Romans says that we take our flesh, we present it as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You do something with your flesh. You tell your flesh what it's going to do. The more spiritually built up you can get, the more you're going to have control over telling your flesh what it's going to do. Amen. It's like I don't ask how I feel, I tell how I feel. Amen. Amen. That's what Smith Wigglesworth used to say. How you, how you feeling today? He says, I don't ask myself how I feel. I tell myself how I feel, and I'm feeling mighty fine. See, that's your spirit, man. You, you are created three part. You are a spirit. Say, I'm a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. This is just your earth suit. This is, this is as long as you are going to stay here on the earth, this is what you live in. Amen. Some people don't like their earth suit, but, but there's some things you can do to change it. But, uh, but, but you're stuck with it. Amen. And it's perishing. The Bible says that the outward man perishes, but here's the good news. The inward man is renewed day by day by day by day by day. Your flesh might have put on corruption. It's always in a state of dying. That's the truth. But, but guess what? The inward man, he's going to live throughout eternity and will get a glorified body. Amen. And so then we talked about when Jesus went to the well at Samaria, the, the, in Samaria, and he said, I, I must needs go there. I like that because I believe that he was led by the Spirit of God. He said that he, he made statements like, I don't do anything unless I see my Father do it. And I don't say anything unless I hear my Father say it. That's how in tune he was with his Heavenly Father. That's why when he did some of the things he did and the miracles he did, it would make your, it, it would make your mind tilt, you know, go tilt. And, that, you know, people think he just laid awake at night trying to think of different ways that he could do miracles. No, he, he, he worked them the way his father showed them to work them. And here's another important, an important thing to know is that Jesus did not do any miracles until he was baptized in the river by John the Baptist. And the Spirit of God came in the, in the form of a heavenly dove and rested upon him. And then from that moment on, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That didn't start until he got anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. 
And that's every believer, every believer needs to do that. So anyway, he had this conversation with her, and, and they started debating, d debating, where's the proper place to worship? And Jesus said, woman, the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For God is a spirit. Let me say that again. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, or being led by the Spirit of God. So when God, when, when, when God, when we make contact with God, it's through the Spirit. I love to feel the presence of God, don't get me wrong, but, but, but the presence of God, God is still with you whether you feel the presence of God or not, because He's in your spirit. And so he's telling us the proper way to, to make contact with God is with our, it's with our five senses that we, that we touch the natural. Isn't that right? What we can taste, see, hear, feel, you know, smell. And, and so it's so easy to be body ruled. But, but we, we can be spirit ruled even over our flesh. And then we talked about, so God is the spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And then we talked about the soul. And when you, when you go and you greet this out, this is talking about the psyche. This is where we get the word like psychologist, psychiatrist. We get those, we get those words, uh, you know, we get that from, from that Greek word. And it's talking about your soul. And your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. Your mind and your will and your emotions. And so what happens is that it's easy to become emotionally ruled, so to speak. I mean, it, have you ever heard this? It's Monday. What do you, what, what's the connotation? Well, it's going to be a bad day because it's Monday. Said who? I mean, I'm so thankful God doesn't say, well, it's Monday. I'm not going to do anything today. Right. He's, not, he's not ruled by, by, by how, how he feels, you know. Uh, you know it, and it's so, easy to, it's so easy to tap over into that realm in, where, where everything becomes emotional. And this is what I have found out. The times where I really need to hear from God, not only do I really need to hear from God, but very often the emotions, the side wants to kick in. The enemy loves to put people in places of pressure and get them to make decisions based on, on pressure. And God doesn't want us to, to make decisions based on pressure. He wants us to make decisions because we've heard from God. I said, because we've heard from God. And it might look, it might look like, like crazy. It might look like what, what God's shown you to do. It might look like it's the opposite thing of what really needs to happen. But if you will follow him, it will work out the way God had planned it to happen. Amen. 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 So we do something with our soul. He said he restores our soul. We have to renew our minds with the word of God. What happens is that you have to get your mind in line with how God thinks. And how, the, how you get your mind in line to think how God thinks is you have to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to deliver your souls. Because your mind, your mind wants to think squirrely things. Right? Your mind wants to think crazy things. Your mind wants to hook up with your emotion in, 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 in ways of like anger. Anybody ever been angry? Isn't it amazing when people get angry? Isn't it amazing if you could, if, if you could somehow tap in and put a microphone and listen to their thoughts? And they're angry, and their thoughts would be like, I just can't believe that. I need to rah, 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 rah. And so all of a sudden, their, 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 their thought life is hooked up with their emotions. Come on, help me today. Right? And so what you have to do is you have to say, I have to, I have to do something. I have to meditate on the Word of God, and then I have to act on the Word of God. Do you remember what the Lord told Joshua? He said, Joshua, this book of the law, we could say the Word of God, shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now, what was he saying? He's saying, what should be coming out of your mouth? What should you be saying? You should be saying what the Word of God says, just like Schaefer was talking about. You get in agreement and you speak according to the Word of God. You might, it, it, it might look like you're at the bottom of the can and the can's turned up, uh, upside down over your head, but guess what? The Bible says you're blessed. And so instead of, instead of talking about how unblessed you are, you've got to renew your mind. You've got to think, I am blessed only because the Word of God says I'm blessed. I'm not basing it on my circumstances. I'm basing it on the truth of the Word of God, and I'm going to line up with my mouth with what the Word of God says, and I'm going to act like it's so because it is. Yeah. Brother Hagin used to say this, one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ is for people to renew their minds. Greatest need. In addition to that, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. 
if we're going to be people that operate in faith, we got to hear the Word of God. So you have, to, you have to bring those thoughts. We talked about 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 3rd verse. It, says, it talks about taking every thought captive. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, how do you know if it's exalting itself against the knowledge of God if you do not have the knowledge of God? You hear what I'm saying? So what happens is when you feed yourself with the Word of God, it renews your mind, but not only does it renew your mind, it gets down in your spirit, and then out of your spirit, the Holy Spirit Himself will bring out the Scriptures of the Word of God that pertain to your situation because you've hidden them in your heart. It's not done by osmosis. You have to do it. You have to do something with your thought life. When these, when these thoughts come in, I mean, you have to, right there, you need to have a radar system. And these thoughts come in, and your radar system needs to go, boop, 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 incoming thought, incoming thought. And then you look at that thought. Is that thought in agreement with God's Word, or is that thought in disagreement with God's Word? And if, re, if you've renewed your mind, when that thought comes, then you make the decision. He says you bring it into captivity. You cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If that thought is exalting itself against what God said in the Word of God, don't think on it. Cast it down and say, I'm not going to think on that. See, this is where a lot of people have, have, have a hard time walking in peace. Because what, what, what is peace? It's, when it's, 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 it's something that's a peace of God that passes all understanding. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But peace comes based on, the Bible says, He will give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And one of the ways we keep our mind stayed on him is by spending time in his word. And let me just encourage you, whatever struggle that you struggle with in your life, whether it's physical or financial or emotional, whatever it is going on in your life, I want to encourage you, get into the Bible and find the scriptures that have something to do with what you are going through. If you need healing, you spend time renewing your mind about what, what the Bible says about healing. If you need a breakthrough in your finances, then you spend time, you just get a concordance and find every scripture that talks about provision or blessing or whatever, and, and God meeting your need, and you spend time and you renew your mind with the Word of God. Because then when the thoughts come, like I was talking about, and those thoughts come and they begin to try to penetrate your mind, and that's where the enemy works. He said the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. The biggest battle any Christian is going to battle and any human being actually is going to be up here in the mind. And that's where he's going to attack. That's why he's called the deceiver. What does that mean to be deceived? It means that you believe a lie. Jesus said you're the liar and the father of all lies. So when he comes with these thoughts, he's wanting you to believe a lie. Well, what's a lie? Anything contrary to the truth of the word of God. So he wants to penetrate your mind and get you all messed up and, and put a nest in your brain and your thinking, right? Just like you can't keep a bird from, 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 from flying over your head, but you can keep him from making a nest, right? And, and so you have to do something when those thoughts start flying. You've got to do something. You've got to judge them according to the Word of God. And if it doesn't line up, you throw it down. And then the Bible says the next step is whatsoever things are, are pure and holy, and lovely, and of a good report. Think on these things. But if you go the verses before that, he was talking about peace. Aren't you glad that God gives us answers in the Word of God that we can overcome no matter what it is that's trying to torment or what it is that's trying to come against our lives through our thought life? So that's your soul. I mean, that's, that's your soul, and you have to do something with it. God, God is not going to do anything for you with it. You have to do something with it. You have to spend, I just, I just can't encourage you enough. This, this is the answer. This is the answer. This is the answer to in any, a million and one situations you can come up with. The answer, God's word is the answer. Amen. So we, we, we talked about that more in depth last week. So we're going to move on here. Let me get down to where I want to go here. So I began to say something about Joshua. He said, this word of, the, of God shall not depart out of your mouth. That means we should always be, always be having what comes out of our mouth. Let my mouth be filled with your praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Schaefer was talking about praise. What, what should be coming out of our mouth? The Word of God. Don't, don't, don't let it depart out of your mouth. Meaning always, always have the Word of God. When you see situations, I mean, no matter what it is, it can be, a, it can be, a, it can be an impossibility. But what you can just say what the Word of God says. 
What did Jesus teach in Mark 11? Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. So what's coming out of your mouth? Mountain, I'm speaking to you. It might be a mountain of debt, a mountain of, of physical problem, whatever it is, but you begin to speak to it. You say, Mountain, you got to go in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Mountain, you got to go. Mountain of debt, you got to go. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. What's coming out of my mouth? What I put in my heart. So when, you, you know, when, when you're looking at a financial situation, you just have to just put your foot down and say, God, you are going to supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory. And you can really tap into this if you are somebody who gives because the Bible says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall he cause men to pour into your bosom. Right? So that's just God. There's, there's nothing Schaefer missed. There's nothing wrong with holding God to his word. It pleases him. It pleases him, first of all, that you know what his word says. In, in Isaiah it says, put me in remembrance. How many think God forgot? No, he said, put me in remembrance. Remind me. Remind me. What, is he, what are you doing? You, you're, you're, you're releasing faith and you're releasing the word of God and you're keeping your mind renewed. You're keeping your mind stayed on him. Amen. So he told Joshua, he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Now, when we hear that word meditate, a lot of uh, you know, Eastern religions and stuff, they've kind of stolen this whole idea of meditation and, and, and turned it into something that God never intended it to be. But that, that word meditate, it means to think on. Um, it means to mutter. So there we are, we're speaking again. It, it means to, to mutter this word of God, speak the word of God. Um, it can be likened to a cow, and a cow chews his cud. A cow takes grass, for instance, and he, he's got, basically, I don't know a lot about it, but he's got more than one stomach. Four, thank you, Pam would know. In, 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 uh, he's got four stomachs, so he brings it down, he chews it, but then he's able to bring it back up and chew on it some more. You see, there's, there's, things, <laughs> there's things in the Word of God you've chewed on, but there's still something else in that Word. I said, there's, you, you, you just watch in these days, there's going to come fresh revelation of things we thought we knew, and the revelation is going to come forth by the Spirit of God that was in His Word. Amen. So as you meditate on it and you think on it, guess what's going to happen? Let me read it to you. He says, Joshua, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will fail not thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why are you doing that? That you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now notice this. For then you shall make your way prosperous. That's powerful right there. It's not saying God is going to make your way prosperous. He said that if you will meditate in the Word of God and you observe to do what the Word of God says, you are going to make your way prosperous. Why? Because the Word, the way of the Word is already prosperous. Amen. But when you begin to, 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 to follow God's instructions and meditate on the Word of God, you, you have everything to do whether you're going to prosper or not by observing what God said to do. He said, do you will make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. How many people want good success? I think everybody in here and everybody under the sound of my voice wants success. So, I want to just talk about how, how, how we need to hear from God, and even concerning things where God needs to reveal things to us. You know, a lot of people, I like, I like what Paul said in Philippians. He said this, for we are the circumcision, third chapter, third verse, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. For though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
So he's talking about if anybody should have a confidence in the flesh, it would have been him. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Uh, history tells us that he, would, he was being taught by some of the great teachers of the Jewish law. And because of what he was, that he would spend up to seven hours a day reading and memorizing Scripture. Think about that. I don't think it's any mistake that God chose Paul to write two-thirds of the New Testament. I don't think it's any mistake that God brought the whole revelation of the mystery of the gospel, and he brought it to Paul because Paul had understanding of the Word of God. And because he had understanding of the Word of God and the law, that when, when, when the Lord started showing him it's not of the law, it's of faith, Right? He understood what the law, what, what the law said. He, he actually would have understood things concerning what the Messiah would look like. Yeah. Right? What he would do. He would have understanding of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. He would have understanding of, what, of, of what, what is included in redemption. He would know all these things because of his skill and training. See, that's why it doesn't matter where you are. You're always being trained. Yeah. I said you're always being trained. Man, I just, I just wish everything would just, you know, no, no. As, as, as soon as you hit that next place, God's got another place for you. Yeah. Yeah. He wants us to grow up. We're going we're, we're to be growing up until. And I'm convinced when we're, when we're in heaven, we're still going to be growing up. And we're still going to be learning things that we had no idea about. God's still going to be revealing things to us. Yeah. Amen. So let me just encourage you, be teachable. Be teachable. Don't, don't think you know everything. I don't know anything. I mean, that, that, that's how I feel. The more I know, the more I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm just being, I'm just being honest with you. There's just, there's just so much, so much, so much in the things of God. So much. That, I mean, he, that, he's unfathomable. You can't measure his wisdom or his knowledge or his understanding or his mercy or his love or his goodness. I mean, you can't. There's, there's, there's nothing here that you can even measure it with. Amen. So he was a. He said that he was a, a, a chosen vessel for those days. Now in Acts six, what will help you become more sensitive to the Spirit of God? Well, the Word of God, but you can't leave out prayer. You cannot leave out prayer. I say it this way: if, if all you ever do is hear the Word of God and spend time in the Word of God, you will dry up. I'm serious about that. It'll become just total ritualistic religious, and if all you ever do is, is you're just all about the Holy Spirit and, 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 and not praying, and let me just tell you this, when you develop your word knowledge and your word base, it will make you become a more effective prayer also, right? Because you can pray the will of God, and you can, one of the greatest ways you can pray is pray the Scripture, pray what the Word of God says, amen? So, but, but you have to also develop your, your spirit man. Your spirit, man, you have to develop him. And so, so how, how do you go about doing this? Well, I like what Paul said in Acts 6.1. It says, And in those days when the numbers of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians amongst the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now he's talking about, he's talking about the, the, those that were called the, the apostles that were called to act or called to preach and teach the Word of God. He said, we shouldn't get all bound up with all these other things serving, serving the widows. We need to give ourselves, this is what he said, it is not reason that we should leave the t Word of God and serve tables. It doesn't mean that they thought that they were better than anybody else or it was beneath them to do that. It says, wherefore, brethren, now notice this, wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, now notice this, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Wow. Being full of the Holy Ghost, having a good report, and having wisdom <laughs> is a requirement that God is looking for for people that serve in the local church. They were serving meals to the widows, and yet this was the type of people that the Holy Spirit wanted them to pick up to do the work. That's why very often when, when, when we come out, before we come out and we pray, I, I, I ask the Lord, man, these, these people in every capacity of the helps ministry in this church, they are anointed by God. They are anointed to stand and to serve. Amen. They're anointed to do it. He said, look ye out, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So now notice two things, prayer and word, prayer and word. Now that doesn't mean that's just for them either. 
Amen. You have to give yourself continually. I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just trying to encourage you. Before I was in the ministry, I was giving myself continually to prayer and the Word whenever I could. I, I, I went to every, every prayer meeting that I possibly could. I mean, I, I spent time in the Word of God. I had a lot of windshield time when I, when I was in outside sales. and I was always listening to the Word of God. Amen. Why? Because I want to be full of the Word, and I want to be full of the Holy Spirit, and I want to be full of wisdom, and I want to have revelation. It just doesn't... I mean, a lot of people, they're just satisfied being saved. I mean, and that's glorious. That's wonderful. Thank God. I mean, thank God you, you, you're going to spend eternity in heaven, but I'm not satisfied with just being saved. I'm not satisfied with just squeaking in by the skin of my teeth into heaven. I mean, I, I think one of the saddest things that's going to happen to people is they're going to stand before the Lord and, and on, on that day, and, and, and the Lord is going to show them their life, and He's going to show them what He had for their life. I guarantee you, every person will come up short. Amen. You're, he's he's going to show you things. You're going to say, I had no idea that's what you had. I had no idea that's what you wanted me to do with my life. I had no idea that was the career I was supposed to pick. So we just do everything just so, so haphazard. It's, we we got to get out of this thinking. God's got purpose. God's got plan for your life. I mean, I, I mean, I just find people they just do. The, I mean, they'll just they'll, they'll they'll quit something where the Lord has them because they can make two dollars more an hour down the street. Don't be foolish. Check in with God. <laughs> it's a process. It's being led. It's step by step by step. Sometimes He's got to take you places where you can get educated. That's why education's a great thing. It's not college for everybody. Sometimes it's trade school or whatever, or working for somebody that's going to mentor you and put things into you. Yeah. And if we're not led by the Spirit of God, all we're looking at is the dollar. Yeah. And the whole thing is it's God's plan because He's got somebody else in your life that's going to help you get to the next place. Yeah. A lot of people think, I can just make it on my own. I can just do everything I want. You're missing out on God's best. I said, you're missing out on God's best. I, I, look at my, my, I look at my work experience before I ever got into the ministry. And God, even then, was preparing me for the ministry, even though I couldn't have told you that at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 I mean, I was in sales, and I'm still in sales. I just got the best product anywhere, and it's eternal, and it doesn't cost you anything, and it never wears out, and it never gives out, and it never has to be replaced. It's called the gospel of the good news, amen, that you can be born again. I tell people this, and I, I, I don't think people believe me, but when I would go out and make sales and make sales presentations and call on customers, honest to God, the Holy Spirit would come up on me. He would come up on me and he would anoint me. And he would have me to say things I didn't even know I was going to say. Why? Because he knows how to minister <laughs> to that customer or potential customer. Tell me. And people are like, oh, come on. He's not in, he's not in. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. If he had his, if he had his way, you'd be number one. You'd be, the, you'd, you'd, you'd be the top. You'd be the best out there. He wants, I mean, think about it. You're his child. People say, well, everybody's a child of God. No, they're not. The only way you can be a child of God is you've got to be born into him. And that's called being born again. Jesus, Jesus told the Sadducees and Pharisees and couldn't seize and wouldn't seize. You're of your father, the devil. He told them who their father was. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. In fact, I think, I think it's time. That why, why should all the wealth be in the world? We are, we are in contact with the creator of the heavens and earth. I mean, I would think that he can, this, this creator who knows everything and knows the beginning from the end, 
right? And everything in between. I would think that he could give some Christians some understanding and some revelation and some wisdom to come up with the next witty invention or next internet or whatever, whatever the, the future holds. I shared that story about the man at Caterpillar. I can't remember his name. Caterpillar, they make the tractors and stuff. He was an engineer, product engineer. And they came up with this problem, and he couldn't fix it. And he, he was a born-again Christian, spirit-filled. And he went into his office, and he sat down, and he started praying in the spirit and asking the Lord about it. And the Lord showed him exactly what to do. And he went and he, he made this, went out and got his team together, and they made these changes and, this, and, and, and produced some sort of part or something that fixed the issue. He told the Lord, when the Lord gave him the answer, he said, Lord, if you give me this answer, I will tithe 90% of my income. Oh, dear Jesus. Anybody want to be in that place? That you live off the 10% and you live well. He made millions and millions and millions of dollars off that. And he gave 90% of it back to the Lord. Amen. You know why? Because your spirit knows things your head doesn't know. One of my favorite scriptures, most of you could probably tell me what it is. Proverbs 3, 5th verse. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. See, we follow God with our heart. doesn't say trust with Him with all your head, with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Now, there's nothing wrong with having understanding, right? Thank God. You know, He, he gave us a mind to use, right? He doesn't want to just be a bunch of, bunch of zombies that, that don't think for ourselves. He gave us, he, he, he gave us, He created us that way. But the, uh, the ultimate thing is we trust the Lord, and we trust Him with all of our heart. See, you can, you can be believing God, and your heart is in faith, and you're trusting in Him, and your mind can be giving you just the battle of your life. It can just be, it can just be going bonkers, but yet in your heart... I mean, there's, I've had things happen in life, and, and, and I, I can't explain it. I just knew that I 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 knew. Did it look different? Did it, did, did it look like what I knew in my heart? Did it look like what I knew in my heart? Absolutely not. But I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew. And I tell you, when you can get into that place that you know that you know that you know, it can't be pulled out of you by a John Deere tractor. Because you just know. You just know. Well, how do you know? I know in my knower. Yeah, but pastor, look, th that can't be. It couldn't be like that. I know in my knower. I'm not moved by what it looks like. I know that 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 I know. Everyone in here, born again, you've got a knower, and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, and He knows all things. Jesus said that He would give you the Holy Spirit. He would not leave you fatherless or like orphans. He said, I'm sending another comforter. He said that comforter would be your standby, your counselor, your helper, your intercessor. Just think what He gave you. And he said he would take what he hears from heaven, what he hears the Father say. He would take that, and Jesus would take that, and, and it would be transmitted by the Holy Spirit in your spirit. Not, not out here somewhere, in your spirit. That's what I'm talking about, knowing that you know. He said, I will transmit it. I will put it in your spirit. First John says you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. You know all the, well, it certainly doesn't seem, no, you, you, you can know everything you need to know. Yeah. Why? You have an unction, you have an anointing on the inside of the Holy Spirit. He knows. Yeah. See, there's things, it's not, it, it, there's things that they're, they're, they're hidden. 1 Corinthians 14 calls them mysteries. Yeah. They're hidden secrets. But then it goes on in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, it talks about we have the mind of Christ and that the, the, the Holy Spirit, He can bring forth these things. Yeah. But it comes out of our spirit. Yeah. 
like I said, I'm not, I'm not beating up on, 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 on you know, human natural uh, you know, understanding. That's very important. But man, the Holy Spirit, He knows. You don't have to go down the wrong road. You don't have to marry the wrong person. You don't have to take the wrong job. You don't have to buy the wrong car, the wrong house. You don't have to get in that car accident. You don't have to get on that plane that's going to crash. You don't have to eat that food at that restaurant that's got food poisoning. I'm serious. We've got to be practical. He will lead and God and direct you. Well, how? Well, He transmits it. He puts it in your spirit. And sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just a sense. Do you remember when they... <clears throat> I, if I would have went on there and they appointed those guys, they said it seemed good to them and the Holy Ghost. It seemed good. Sometimes it just seems right. It seems good. Other times, something isn't right. I can't put my finger on it. I can't explain to you what it is, but this situation or this, this, this decision or whatever, there's just something not right about it. I don't know what it is, and truthfully, I don't even have to know what it is. I just have to know the prompting of the Holy Spirit that is saying, hmm. You see, it's, it, it's, we can liken it to like traffic. And, you know, you're going down the road and you see a green light. That means go, right? But what happens when it turns yellow? People say, punch it. No, you don't punch it. <laughs> when it turns yellow, that, <laughs> that means you proceed with caution. Yeah. Right? If you're still going to some, some intersections, all they have is a flashing yellow light. You just don't barrel through that thing. You slow down. And then a red light. What's that mean? It means stop. And sometimes when you're led by the Spirit of God, very often that's what it's like. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. And then, mm. You know, you, just, you slow down. It's cautious. I, I'm going to ask the Lord about this some more. What, what, what's up here, Lord? Sometimes, mm -mm, grieved. Feel grieved in your spirit. Don't do it. Don't go there. Don't do it. But Lord, I really want to do that. I really want to go there. Don't do it. This happens to people all the time. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Lord, I really want to do that. Lord, I really want to do that. I really want to do that. God, I really want to do that. And then they override the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then they find themselves in a mess. And then they want to blame God for the mess they're in. I know none of you have ever done that. Do you remember when Paul, he wanted to go into Bithynia in Asia? He was on a missionary journey. And it said that when he want, went there, the Spirit forbade him. Forbade him. Then he tried to go somewhere else. And the Spirit, no. Well, how do you think that worked? On the inside of him. This is, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. And the Lord said, mm -mm, no, huh, that's not right. Don't, don't do that. That's being led by the Spirit of God. That's making a decision based on, I mean, after all, didn't Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel? Well, isn't Bithynia all the world? Couldn't be anything wrong with that. Well, evidently, it's not what the Lord wanted. He had, he had something else. Now, why didn't he just tell him, why didn't he just tell him at the very beginning what it was? You ever wonder that? Because it's faith. Faith is a requirement. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so as he was making preparations, and the Holy Spirit said, mm -mm. and he said, we're going to go over here, and the Holy Spirit says, mm -mm. then something more supernatural happened. He had a vision. You remember this? This is in the Bible. It'll bless you. In the book of Acts. He had a vision, and he, he saw a man saying, come to Macedonia. Come down to Macedonia. Come to Macedonia. I think it's interesting. Uh, he was being led by the Spirit of God. He could have been led by the Spirit of God to go to Macedonia. Being led by the Spirit of God is supernatural. It's just not as spectacular. Right? Don't be out there looking for the spectacular. You have the supernatural. Amen. The spectacular is, that, is, is as God pleases. But being led by the Spirit of God is God's already pleased and it's all the time. Yeah. Right? So he had this vision. And you know, you sometimes wonder, uh, why, why did he have this vision? Well, when you realize what happened when he got to Macedonia, 
When you find yourself, I've, I've been there. When you find yourself in a mess, it is good to know that you heard from God. Because right in the, I've been there. I'm right in the midst. God, this was not my idea. This was your idea. I'm in obedience to you and what you told me to do, and it hasn't come through. Because I knew. So they go to Macedonia. They cast that spirit out of that little fortune teller girl. They get hauled. They get whipped. They get beat. They get put in prison. Remember that? And at midnight, you know the story. At midnight, they, they prayed and they sang praises unto God, and an earthquake hit that place. I guarantee you that when, when, that when he was in that prison, he was glad to know that he had a vision and that he was at the right place. Might not have felt like it, might not have looked at it, but you look at how that whole thing turned around, the prison gates were broke open, and how the jailer and his family and his household were all born again. He got released from prison. He wasn't out of the will of God. But I guarantee you, he, he was thankful that he had that vision. <laughs> when he's getting beaten in that jail, Lord, I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it. I, can, I wonder what Silas is like. Paul, you sure you didn't miss it? I'm sure I didn't miss it. <laughs> and he didn't. Say, it seems good. See, I remember, you've heard the story about this pastor and his wife, and they were going to go on vacation. And of course, when I, at my house, when it was vacation time, it was, I mean, it, we were just like fired up. I don't, I don't know if it was my mom's fault. I'm going to blame her because it's Mother's Day. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, if you're leaving at six, no, huh? Not at our house. You're going to leave early. Never late. Whatever late is on vacation. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, you're, you're excited. We're, we're, we're going to travel, and you've made these plans, and you're excited about your destination and maybe what you got planned to do, and it's just going to be, it's going to be just a wonderful time. And so he's out there packing the car, putting the luggage in the car, and he just kept sensing on the inside, don't go. Don't leave. Who knows? I don't know the story. His wife might have been saying, come on, let's go. But on the inside, it's, don't go. Don't go. Don't leave. You know, whenever you sense that, don't go. And it, listen, don't go doesn't, doesn't always mean never. Yeah. Don't go might be you're just going to yield to the Spirit of God and say, what's going on, Lord? Why, why, why do I have this in my spirit? Why do I sense this in my spirit? What's going on, Lord? Right? It might, it, it might only take a minute. It might take longer. But be willing, to, be, be willing to do whatever you have to do until you know. And of course, they got in their car and they went down the road. They were only a few miles down the road and a car crossed the center line and hit them head on. Killed the pastor's wife, and he survived, and he, he lived, and he told this story. That when they're packing that car, he's sensing, don't go, don't go. Now you think about a head-on collision. How many seconds would it take to avoid that? What if they delayed their leaving, just whatever? Minute, two minute, five minute, ten, whatever. They wouldn't have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. See, and then, then, you, get, you, then you get religious people, and they want to blame God. Like God, God took him out. He needed, a, needed another tulip in heaven. God was, God, God was trying to warn him. Warn him, don't go. You get anything out of this? I am. I get something every, every time I administer this, I get something out of it. It's, it's impo this, is, this is important. This has always been important. But in tumultuous times, my goodness sake. I can tell the Spirit's just settling in here. Selah. So as you, as you pray, as you seek the Lord, and just, just be willing. 
I mean, have you ever wanted something so bad? I mean, all of us have probably made decisions because we just had to have it. Just wanted it so bad. Ended up being really bad. You get what you want, and then you don't want what you got. But it can, it can, it can pertain to life and death. So it just didn't, didn't seem right. didn't seem good to the Holy Ghost. That's one way to say it. The Holy Spirit on the, something just didn't seem right. So that's being led by the Spirit of God. There's other times it's more, it's more authoritative. It's like almost like the Holy Spirit speaking out in the, on the inside of you. To you, it's like maybe somebody else even heard it, but it's strong. I'll share this example, and then we'll go home. I remember years ago, many of you have heard this. I was coming home from work, drove the same way every day, came to the same intersection every day. It was a weird intersection. You come around a curve underneath a railroad, a railroad crossing, and there's just a weird uh, intersection there. And I'm coming down, and I haven't got to the curve yet, and I heard this loud, slow down. I looked at the speedometer. I wasn't speeding. Around that curve, I got a green light, and right in front of me, here comes a car flying through a red light. See, the reason we say, slow down, what do you mean? See, you know the voice of God. It wasn't here. It was here. I mean, if the devil had his way, he'd say, maintain the speed. Gotta warn us. Remember when Paul got on the ship that was gonna go down? In that storm, he perceived. He perceived this voyage was gonna be dangerous. He perceived. That doesn't mean that the Lord said anything to him. He perceived it. He knew it. He just knew something. He knew it in his knower. And I don't know. This, this isn't gonna be good. Of course, he went and told him he's a, you know, he's a he's in he's in custody. And they didn't listen to him. And they went out into the voyage. You know how it happened. The storm came after many days. He tossed to and fro, and everything's breaking up. And an angel of the Lord appeared, appeared to him and said, Cheer up! See, he perceived something. If God would have had his way, he would have perceived it, and the journey wouldn't have proceeded. That was what the Lord's will was. His will wasn't for him to be out there many days, being cast to and fro and the ship breaking up, throwing all the tackle and the goods off the side of the ship. But then that angel appeared to him and said, cheer up. Cheer up. You're going, blah, 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 water and wind. And, and then, he, then he gets to go, hey, cheer up. Be glad. It's going to be all right. The wind is still raging. raging. The storm is still raging. But he heard from God. He heard from God. He knew the end. Yes. He told him it's going to go. You're, you're going to appear before Caesar, just like, just like I told you. It's going to go. It's going to happen. So when you hear from God, you, I mean, it, that's what I'm talking about. You hear from God, and, and you, can, you can go through a storm. Yeah. Yeah. When you've heard from God, you'll go through the storm. Yeah. You don't like the storm. It's not fun being in the storm. Right. But you can rest assured you're going through the storm because you heard from God. Amen. Well, we're out of time. Well, Father, as we go out these doors, I pray for each and every person in this place. Lord, I ask that you just minister life to them in the name of Jesus. And Father, just perchance there's someone here who doesn't know you, who hasn't received you as their Lord and Savior, I want to give you an invitation this morning. Let me say it this way. If you don't know, if you were to die, that heaven would be your home. You can know. Or it could be maybe you've just grown cold. You've backslid. Maybe something happened in life. Maybe you went through a divorce you didn't want or had to file bankruptcy or a medical situation, the loss of a loved one. Many things can happen in life. And you've just grown cold and you've turned away from God. Well, He loves you and His arms are wide open to receive you back into fellowship. 
with every head bowed, every eye closed, just for one moment here. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just simply going to say a prayer for you. If that's you, just lift your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. That's me. I want to know so. I want to be sure that I'm all right with you. I want to be all right with God. I want to know where my eternity is. Amen. All right. So everybody in here, you're right with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good. Well, as you go out these doors, be blessed. I want to thank everybody who, uh, who, sh who came Wednesday and everybody that prepared and helped. And that was a wonderful, wonderful time. I appreciate your, your, uh, your, your acts of, of serv serving and people who helped financially. It just went, everything just went wonderful and good food. So God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday morning.